In this video, I'm going to be talking about my wheel setup. I'll be discussing the equipment I use to make pots and the reasons behind my choices, together with sharing some tips and tricks I've learned along the way. Perhaps the most important piece of equipment in my studio is my pottery wheel, and I've been using this Rhoda HMT 500 since 2019 and I still love it. I throw practically every single pot I make on this wheel, and I'll discuss a little more about it later on. The next piece of vital equipment is my throwing gauge. This tool helps me throw pots that are all identical, without having to use a ruler to measure each piece individually. The next piece I can't live without is my mirror. I don't use it to look at myself, rather it's positioned in such a way that allows me to see a perfect side view of the pot I'm making, and I find it inconceivably useful. Following this is the water I use for throwing, which might sound obvious, but I think there's a few tips and tricks I can share about the container used and where it's positioned on the wheel. Next is the reclaim bucket. This is where all my clay scraps are placed into, from both the throwing and trimming process in order to be recycled, which is something you should definitely be doing with your waste rather than simply discarding it. And lastly, there's the wear boards. These are the wooden planks I place my thrown pots onto, and I'll be discussing how I use them and position them for an efficient workflow. Pottery wheels are one of those things where everybody has their own personal preference. You may prefer the style of wheel you learn to throw with, and there'll be specific styles of tray, wheel head, and chair that you like. And I think you can't really go wrong if you're purchasing a potter's wheel from one of the top brands, such as Rhoda, Shimpo, Brent, or any other wheel that costs about £1,200 to £2,500. Wheels like this should last a lifetime, but I still think the best option, if you're a beginner, is to look for a second-hand wheel and eventually save for one of these. Many cheaper alternatives have popped up on Amazon over the last few years, and for those I'd just say be cautious, as they aren't built to last in the same way these are, nor can they handle throwing larger amounts of clay. But if you're just starting out, they aren't the worst option, but they definitely shouldn't be the wheel you aim to use on a professional level. Speaking of level, that's something my studio's floor is not, so I've just shoved a few bats underneath these legs to prop it up. Most wheels these days spin both clockwise and anti-clockwise, and anti-clockwise is typically the direction we throw in in the west. As for the wheel tray, I prefer ones that are relatively spacious. It means they don't fill up so quickly with scraps, and they're easier to tidy up. As for the seat, this Rhoda HMT 500 is simple, wooden, and slopes forward ever so slightly, which puts your body into a better position for throwing. The new version of this wheel, the HMT 600, comes with a small pre-built shelf like this. But for this wheel, I built one myself, as wheels never seem to have enough space around them for all the tools you need, your throwing gauge, mirror, and water. To keep this worktop stable, I simply fasten it in place with a small clamp like so. The wooden surface above is really heavily varnished. This way it doesn't stain with all the tools that are placed on it, nor does the piece of wood bow over time. My throwing gauge is actually fastened onto this platform, so when clamping it down I just have to make sure that the throwing gauge's pointer is totally in line with the very centre of the wheel. This throwing gauge is made by my friend and potter, Darren Ellis. He was one of Lisa Hammond's ex-apprentices, and that's where I met him. It's a simple contraption that you can adjust and set so the rubber pointer rests just beside the rim of the pot you're making. So, when I'm repetition throwing, I throw a pot and measure it with a ruler. Then, once it's correct, I set the gauge's pointer so it sits just next to the rim, so it measures the height and diameter of the pot, and it gives me a physical target in space to aim for as I'm throwing, which helps to no end, and is certainly better than throwing blind when your goal is to make pots that all look the same, and it does speed up your making process considerably, as you aren't having to measure every single pot by hand, and the fact that it has two arms means you can set one for the rim of the pot and one for the belly, which makes it even more useful. Now for the mirror. Without one, this is my view of the pot I'm making from above. It's skewed, and you can't really see the underside of the form you're making, whereas if you have a mirror with one quick, Glance up, you can see a perfect side view of the piece you're throwing, or trimming, allowing you to see the real shape of the pot. These days, if I throw without a mirror, it feels as if somebody has taken away one of my senses, as I'm having to spend so much more time bending over awkwardly to see the real shape of the pot, or I have to climb off the wheel and crouch down to see the side view, all of which can be negated by simply having a mirror in front of you. These tall wooden ones are from Ikea. They work for tall and small pots. They're easy to clean and they stand up relatively securely. Next is your throwing water. In the winter, I always use hot water to throw with. I'll even boil the kettle and mix that with a splash of cold water, as there's nothing worse than throwing with cold clay using really cold water. 
My chamois leather, which I use for smoothing the rim of the pots I make, lives on the edge of this bucket, and if you're prone to losing these, it's worth cutting a small hole in it and then attaching a cork via some cordage to it so it floats. I also like a container that has a sharp edge. This way I can scrape the excess slip off my hand as I'm throwing if too much builds up. As for the positioning of this bucket, and this might sound really obvious, but you want to position it in such a way that when you go to scoop out water, it won't drip on the floor or on the workbench in front of you, and instead it only goes in the wheel tray or on the pot itself. If there's too great a distance, you'll get this workbench wet, which potentially means your tools get messy and the water from up there can end up dripping onto the floor. Basically, I want to minimize the amount of potential mess I can make, as over the years, all that extra time really adds up. This is also why recently I've started to place all my throwing tools on a small wooden bat in front of me. This way the mess is confined to that platform and when I'm finished throwing I can simply lift this away and all the clay covered tools on it, like so. Again, this probably only saves a few seconds, but anything to make tidying up just that bit more straightforward is worth it, in my eyes. The pedal is obviously another important part of the wheel. This controls how quickly the wheel spins. And once again, I think there's a lot of personal preference around these, but I love the one Rhoda supplies as it's a Yamaha pedal. It just feels right. It's more ergonomic and the pivot point is in the right place as it's right by the heel of my foot, which makes it easier to press. And going from this to other pedals on other wheels always feels a bit strange. Next, I'll be talking about reclaim and how I make it easy for myself. Rhoda's wheels have a hose in the bottom of the splash pan, which helps slip and water drain out, which again just helps to keep things a bit tidier. Hoses were quite a common feature on wheels here in the UK in the past, but they disappeared on some of the more modern, perhaps more manoeuvrable wheels, which is understandable, as if you're using a hose, it means you also need to keep a reclaim bucket directly next to your wheel, which isn't always possible in every studio environment. The splash tray, as well as collecting slops from the throwing process, also collects trimmings. And by having a reclaim bucket that can go directly next to my wheel, it makes scooping out all this waste just that much easier, as I'm not having to put all of these trimmings into one receptacle to then dump them into another. Instead, it just goes straight from wheel tray to reclaim bucket to plaster bat, which just helps to streamline cleaning up and the recycling process. When I'm production throwing, I also have another bucket next to me. Like the container I keep my throwing water in, this has a lovely sharp plastic rim. And when I finish throwing a pot, in order to lift it off the wheel, I scrape all the slip off the palm of my hands on this sharp edge. This leaves my palms relatively dry and with the walls of the pot scraped clean of slip too, it makes lifting pots away without distorting them relatively easy, with some practice, of course. It's also in this bucket that I wash my hands. I don't use the sink in my studio to do this. Additionally, before I ever use a towel to clean up my hands, I'll first wash as much clay as possible off them. And only then do I dry them off with the tea towel. This way the tea towel never gets really covered in clay and dusty, which as you use will send up dust which you'll breathe in. So I only ever use a towel to dry my hands after I've already cleaned off all the clay with a sponge. And this just means less dust and all the clay that's washed off my hands with the sponge goes into the water and I'll be able to recycle all of that really easily. Next, let's talk about wearboards. Not the most interesting subject, but I'm asked a surprising amount of questions about them and how I use them. My current set is made from 12 mm thick birch ply. They do warp a little bit over time, but to correct that, I sponge clean each side with lots of water and then I let them dry placed on my shelving system with the warped middle facing down. It's onto these boards I place my thrown pots and when production throwing, I shift the boards back like so, so I can easily reach the front end of the board. I then slide the boards forward a little bit and continue placing the pots. This way I'm never having to stretch awkwardly in order to place my pots down. Instead, I'm just repeating the same motion with my arms to move the pot from wheel to board, which means my movements are consistent and repeatable, which helps me pick the pieces away without distorting them. And as I do this, I simply slide the boards into the right place as needs be. In other cases, I place wear boards on both sides, moving pots from one to the other, moving from the board they were stored on to the chuck in the middle to be trimmed, and then the finished pieces are placed onto the empty wear board to the left. It's also quite handy to keep a heat gun, hairdryer, or gas torch next to you to help dry certain forms that are at risk of collapsing as they're being thrown, or for quickly making clay bats like this leather hard. It's onto this pad of clay which I attach MDF bats to throw on. This way I can throw pots on this raised platform, and once they're finished, instead of lifting them away with my hands like you saw earlier, you actually just lift away the bat the pot was thrown upon. 
This is especially useful for certain shapes, such as pots that have a more complex outer surface, which you don't want to distort by smothering them with your hands as you lift them away. And for pots like plates or any low wide tableware, throwing on bats like this is almost essential. When I'm throwing large quantities of pots, I also need to make sure there's an area near my wheel I can store them. And to do this, instead of placing them directly on the wood as that can draw moisture out of the lumps of clay and harden them, I instead just place them on a sheet of plastic like so. This way they can be kept wrapped up and will remain nice and soft throughout the day without stiffening up too much, which does happen in the hotter months. Or if the kilns have been on, I have to be even more careful. Cleaning is a big part of being a potter. Fine clay dust is not good for you and it can give you silicosis with enough exposure. And I figure since I've been doing this since I was 15, I'm probably going to have a bit more exposure than most people, which is partly why I clean up so much. I scrape down the surfaces when the clay is still quite damp and I'm always sponging down the worktops like so. And instead of rinsing these sponges in the sink, I instead squeeze them out in the same bucket I scrape my hands against. This way I recycle as much clay as feasibly possible. Sticking pots down onto these MDF bats can be tricky. So before I slam the clay down, I first rub some water right into the middle of the bat to dampen it. Not so there's any water left on the surface, but so it's soaked into the wood, saturating it. This helps the lumps of clay thrown against it stick far more firmly. And if I'm throwing on bats, another thing I do to just help keep things a bit more clean and tidy is to scrape away excess slip that covers the bat before removing it, as otherwise this just dries out and it's another thing you have to clean eventually. The wooden bat is then pried off and placed on one end of the wearboard. But as I'm throwing these mugs on these small bats, I don't need to be so focused on the wearboard's placement, but you can immediately see how pots thrown on bats take up more space, which means you won't fit as many to a wearboard, which means you may run out of space more quickly. And really, space these days is my biggest bottleneck. As my studio is only so large and I can only store so many wearboards worth of thrown work, in the space at any one time, which is why if I can lift the pots away with just my hands and place them side by side more closely on the wearboards, then I will, as it's more space efficient. Although having pots stacked so closely side by side can make wearboards difficult to carry as they're so heavy, and the pots will also dry more slowly as there's less space between them. So really there's pros and cons for both methods. Lastly, for wearboards, you'll notice how I always make sure there's a stack of them to my right. This way there's always another wearboard waiting underneath for new pots. And if I do need to pause my throwing overnight, I simply wrap up these weighed out lumps tightly with plastic sheeting. I use dry cleaners plastic, and I'm pretty sure the roll I bought in 2019 when I moved into this studio will last my entire life, as I've barely made a dent in it. I've been making two large batches of individual one-off mugs for my exhibition later this year at Yorkshire Sculpture Park, but I'll save the creation of these for a more dedicated video later on. And the final step, is of course washing all my throwing tools, which I do in the same bucket I scrape the slip off my hands with, which means I keep clay away from the sink. Even though I have a clay trap, it's good practice to do this, as ultimately it means you're saving and recycling more clay, which you can throw into new pots. And lastly, before I go home, I just give the area around my wheel a quick mop to pick up any splashes or drops or dust that's accumulated. It's a moment Chiro always loves, as it symbolizes the fact we're about to go home. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you found this video useful. I know it won't be so interesting for everyone, but hopefully it sheds some light on my wheel setup and my making process.